Hello, friends. Good to see you today. Psalm 42. David asked a riveting question. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will get, uh, yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And by the way, you'll see that same verse repeated in verse, uh, verse 5 of Psalm 42 and in verse 5 of the next psalm. Now, there's a battle raging. It's not on some foreign soil. It doesn't involve armies and artillery. It's not nation against nation. No, it's much closer to home. It's between your right ear and your left ear. It's a mental battle. And every one of us are having to fight that battle in these troubled days. It's a battle against fear and fatigue, a battle against agitation and anxiety, a battle against doubt and discouragement. I'd like to remind us that the most important person we will ever talk to is yourself. The most important person you will ever listen to is yourself. And the battle is fought and won or and uh, won or lost, I should say, in our heads as well as our hearts. What you tell yourself about your circumstances is every bit as important as the circumstances themselves. Yes, there's, there's a battle going on between our ears, and we determine how it's fought and who wins it. Now, David fought his mental battles as well. I mean, forget positive confession. It's time to get real. It's time to, to tell it like it is, to face the truth. And the truth was, life wasn't so great. The truth was, he was down. In fact, he was so down that he couldn't eat, didn't want to eat. In verse 3, he says, My tears have been my food day and night. A large plate of fear and doubt and worry washed down by a pint of self-pity. His God seemed to be so far away. In fact, so far away that his enemies even noticed. And they taunted him in verse 3 of Psalm 42. Men say to me all day long, where is your God? In verse 10, my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? And I can't answer them because I don't know. I don't know where he is. I've been asking myself that same question. Now, his circumstances are difficult. He's been cut off from the people of God. He can't worship with them. He longs to be in church. He longs to be with the saints. He longs to hear their songs of worship and sing with them. But he is a marked man. An evil king sees him as a threat, and that evil king has an army. And the army is hunting for David. And David is spending his days on the run, hiding in caves, sheltering, pleading with God to save his life. And fueling this downward spiral is David's recollection of, of what used to be the good old days. In verse 4, he says, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. I can hear him saying, Why can't it be like it used to be? I just want normal back. How would you describe David? There are many ways to see him. You can see him psychologically. He is sad and perhaps even depressed. We see him physically. He is stymied, it seems, by arthritis. His body racked by inflammation. He did say in verse 10, my bones suffer mortal agony. We see him socially, and he's an outcast, alienated, cut off from the people he loved. In fact, 
the people God said he would one day lead. Well, now let's bring it up to date. Let's, uh, let's talk about you and me, our world. Much has been said about the impact of the coronavirus and the concern for people's physical health and the economy. And leaders at home and abroad have lived with great tension in trying to find the right balance in preserving both. Mental health needs have been acknowledged, but not nearly enough. We're living in a world that is living with great angst and anxiety and apprehension, a world that is uh, harboring fear and despair, a world that might very well echo David's language. And perhaps you have heard yourself talking in similar terminology, using words like downcast or disturbed. But I want you to notice something about our man, David. He comes around. He turns to a, another reality, a bigger one. He talks to himself in a way that reflects that greater reality. He reminds himself that he's not alone, that his painful situation is not going to last forever, that there is hope. There is always hope because there is an always God. Now, he may not be showing his face. He may not be revealing his mighty hand. He may not be speaking with a loud voice, but he's still God and he is still there. So in that same verse, David says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now, nothing has changed. The king is still the same fear-filled, hate-filled king. David is still hiding in the wilderness. Nothing has changed except for his thinking and his speaking, his speaking to himself. David turns to his God, the very present one. And he's been there the whole time. No tabernacle, no festive throne, no house of God, but that doesn't mean no God. He is still God and he is still present. Present in verse three in David's tears. Present in verse three when David's enemies taunt him. Present in verse 10 when his bones ached and when he was downcast and disturbed. So as we face this virus, let's not allow it to overshadow God or his sovereign purposes. I kind of wonder out loud, Maybe we are in a chapter where life's interruptions are God's interventions, where life's reversals are God's renewals, where life's parentheses carry God's purposes. Maybe the stumbling blocks are stepping stones. Maybe God has put you and me out of the picture for a while so the picture can be all about him. Not you, not me, not our church, not our denomination, not our government, but God and God alone. David just needed to remind himself who was ultimately in charge. To remind himself that how great is his God that God had made him some promises and God never fails to keep his word. So David does a self intervention. This is the guy, by the way, of whom it is written, David encouraged himself in the Lord. And that's what he's doing here. He's preaching to himself. Hey, better days are ahead, David. Put your hope in God. God is good, God is sovereign, and he will never fail you. So how are you talking to yourself? Are you being a good preacher? Let me repeat, the most important person you will ever talk to is yourself. The most important person you will ever listen to is yourself. Jesus said, as a man thinketh in his heart, 
so is he. Paul spoke of singing to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I remind you of a little lady who was dying, but she said within herself, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And so David does a mid-course correction, and he says to himself over and over again, put your hope in God. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God, the living God, in verse 3. The God who is my rock, in verse 9, my Savior and my God, in verse 11. Yeah, that God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today that you have given us divine reassurances. You've given us truth, not from this world. The world can't give it, nor can the world take it away. I thank you that this truth overrides everything else. I thank you, Lord, that we have access to that th truth through your word and our hearts can be enlightened and emboldened by your spirit. And I pray today that we will, our hearts will be fixed upon you, upon David's God. And we can say with David, put your hope in in God, my rock, my Savior, and my God. Amen.